This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Today's episode was recorded at the 2015 Fall Conference of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts held here in Chicago, where I was able to sit down for an hour with Christina Becker. I first met Christina during a trip to Toronto back in August. We had a spirited conversation about Jung, her time in Zurich, why she decided to republish her book, and the unique opportunity she had to train with world-renowned astrologer and Jungian analyst Liz Green. Christina spent a total of six years in Zurich, where she was granted a Diploma of Analytical Psychology by the C.G. Jung Institute, the only institute in the world founded by Carl Gustav Jung. She is currently the president of the Ontario Society of Psychotherapists, a senior analyst with the Association of Graduate Analytical Psychologists, and a senior training analyst with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. In addition to her Jungian training, she has studied astrology at the Faculty of Astrological Studies in London and with Liz Green through the Astro Dean Seminars in Zurich. Christina has lectured at the professional training institutes in New York, Montreal, Buffalo, Calgary, Johannesburg, Zurich, Halifax, and Toronto, and has spoken at various astrological conferences and local Jungian societies across North America. Along with her private practice in the West End of Toronto, she is a workshop leader and a retreat director. Her book is The Heart of the Matter, Individuation as an Ethical Process, originally published in 2004. A second edition was recently published by Chiron in 2014. Thanks so much for your time today, Christina. Oh, happy to be here. So you are a Jungian analyst and you have a private practice in Toronto. Mm -hmm. What is your association with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts? Uh, Well, I uh, joined uh, pretty much as soon as I came back from Zurich. Uh, I've been a member of Interregional since 2005. And I do various things. Uh, I've done some exams. I'm at the moment the parliamentarian for business meetings. Um, yeah, so I'm fairly active. I really just love the group, and it's. Uh, I have lots of good friends here, so it's wonderful to mm-hmm. come and. Is the society just an American, or is it... Uh, no, it's North American. It's North American. So there are five Canadians uh, and a number of people from Mexico. I'm not quite sure how many people from Mexico, but uh-huh. it's a kind of... A, it's a North American. But m- m- most people are from the United States. So you didn't get your analytic training with the interregional. You actually were trained in Zurich, mm-hmm. and you spent five years yeah, there? Yeah, almost six so could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, it, Zurich was a pretty interesting experience. I mean, one of the things that it does is it really takes you out of your what you know. It yeah. takes you away from your family and, and puts you in an environment that is pretty foreign, literally. Right. <laughs> um, but it was such a great experience for me. Um, I love being in Switzerland. I love the depth of the work which mm-hmm. was just really interesting. And, you know, it was actually really interesting to be uh, to be so immersed in... I mean, I really understood when I was in Zurich why Jung developed the psychology that he did, really? right? Because the, the whole area around Lake Zurich is like a little... It's like almost... Um, it's like a, a little valley. Mm-hmm. And it's very... You know, you get this feeling of being kind of closed in and kind of in a cozy kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, the Institute's about a, a, about a kilometer or half a mile from his house. And being able to be with people who actually met him, right. you know, who uh, one of the people I worked with uh, graduated, you know, three years before he died. You know, there is, yeah. there's just this kind of going to the source. Often people talk about the pilgrimage of going to Zurich. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it gives you a very specific, a very unique kind of training, uh, which I really, uh, which I really appreciated. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. You and I had spoken earlier about uh, what you call the analytical genealogy. Oh, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I think it's interesting in terms of seeing where your analyst 
who your analysts trained with right. and then who their analysts trained with. And I think that also has a lot to do with a little bit about how the shadow you know, gets tra- gets brought down through the generations in a, in a similar way to how um, the unconscious, I think, gets passed down f- in families. Oh, right. um, I think the same kind of thing gets passed down, you know, among that. And so if you look at the shadow side or blind spots and things like that, you know, sometimes you can trace that back. It, at least that, you know, that's my hypothesis, and that was the kind of discussions that we had. So, you know, there was Jung, and then Jung trained, um, you know, a number of people, the second generation, a mm-hmm. number of people who went to the United States, the wheelwrights, um, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, Barbara Hanna, C.A. Meyer, a number of that kind of second generation. And then the Institute didn't get started until 1948. Mm-hmm. And then there was a formal formal kind of training program. But before that, there was, you know, he actually, it was your analysis with him and the lectures that happened at the psychology club in Zurich that actually formed the training. Um, and so then the people that I trained with trained with that second generation. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this, it feels like there's this kind of really interesting direct line, right, yeah. to Jung. So I think that was, that's the kind of thing we were th- I was thinking about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so the other thing I think is interesting about that genealogy is that while the core of Jungian psychology, I think, is consistent across the world, each country has their own unique version of it depending on the culture in which mm, mm-hmm. that happens. So people, you know, people trained in Zurich and then they go back to their home countries and they set up institutes right. and then they train. And, um, and so then the flavor of the training gets, is, gets colored by you know, the, the culture, whether it's Australian or the United States or whatever, um, mm-hmm. or Canada, for instance, or uh, South America. It's all very... So there's, you really get a sense of that when you're in the international conferences and really uh, feeling how people are, are quite different. The core, the core seed is, very, is the same, but the... But the nuances are very culturally based. And I think that's really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk about your book. Was this your thesis Mm -hmm. work? The book is called The Heart of the Matter, Individuation as an Ethical Process. You talked about how your devotion to your personal individuation journey. And that you say you're passionate about working with people who feel that they're on a quest for something. You call it an ineffable, mysterious something. Mm. They know that there's something more than the symptoms. They feel called to explore the deeper questions of human existence. Mm. Would you say a little bit more about that? Well, two things, I guess, yes. So the book came out of my thesis, but it came out of my own personal process. Mm -hmm. And this kind of ethical question, individuation as an ethical process, what does it mean? Um, in the integrity in which we encounter our own unconscious mm-hmm. uh, was something that really grabbed me. And um, I, I had a particular instance uh, with one of my early therapists that really was a catalyst for this. And at some point during the training in Zurich, I, st- I started to look at the other side of the ethical question, not so much like you know, the ethics of what does it mean to be a therapist, but also what does it mean to be ethical when we're dealing with the unconscious right. that in fact um, has the potential to um, draw us into it and for us to do things that later on, you know, we're going to be really upset about and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So. So that's where I started to really think about, you know, this idea of individuation as an ethical process. It, for me, it really doesn't matter, um, you know, what you do, because we're all going to screw up. We're all going to, 
the shadow is going to manifest. We're going to put our foot in it. We're going to um, hurt people. We're going to do a number of things as part of our growth. What's really important for me is what happens afterwards. I mean, how do you approach that kind of... When the shadow does uh, erupt, how do you handle it? Uh, what do you say? Uh, where's your integrity? And part of that, for me, is a couple of things. One is clearly to apologize for that. But the other thing is to find out why. You know, what, what's, what's really important? Um, what happened? You know, what, where were you unconscious in that particular thing? And what does that tell you about yourself? Uh, I remember hearing a story about Jung who said, uh, or actually... You know, he he would he was known to have quite a, a temper, and yeah. he would blow up occasionally. Mm -hmm. But then I heard somebody say, and then he would immediately go and find out why. And I think that's really oh. about why how you bring the integrity into it. He called it that special act of reflection. Mm -hmm. So I think so. That's that's really you know it's really about. It, ultimately, it's about ourselves, right? It's ultimately about right. how, what our, our own process is and, and what's the attitude in which that we bring to our process. So the second question, which is uh, kind of leads me into the heart metaphor at the work that I'm doing now, yeah. which is really the kind of mystical aspect and the divine and, you know, the entryway to the, di the divine through the heart. Mm -hmm which really is the, about the spiritual aspects of Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And so a number of people in my practice are, are coming to me saying, you know, I'm depressed or I'm anxious or whatever, and I don't want to take medication. Right. That's particularly probably a Canadian thing, but we are, you know, there are a number of people that are saying, I don't want, I don't want to take medication um, it's, you know, I've been on medication, it's not helping, but I, I, I do, I feel like there's something else there that yeah. I need to find out what it is. James Hillman actually talks about this um, in one of his, um, in one of his books, which I thought was really interesting. He talks about the fact that um, there's something other that hold the analyst and the client together. It's not just about the symptom. It's not just about the depression or what's going on. But there's some third thing which he identified as the soul that, that kind of binds the process and also directs the mystery. And I thought that was a really interesting thing because I wonder myself why people... You know, we're kind of going. Well, okay. What? Why do they keep coming, right? But there's something that there's something that holds one in the process. Um, that sense of questing and sense of uh, seeking and trying to understand. Um, you know, some larger questions. You mean why do they keep coming back to, for sessions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and also, I mean, I'm also speaking a lot about myself too, because I, you know, that's the thing that keeps me going. Just trying to understand, um, trying to understand myself, trying to understand yeah. why particular things happen to me, you know, a number of stuff like that. I like that story that you told about Jung uh, having a temper, which I've always had a temper, blowing up, which mm -hmm. I used to blow up all the time, <laughs> and then immediately afterward wanting to find out why. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do in analysis. Mm -hmm is I, during the week, you know, I'd live my life and have my tantrums mm -hmm. and, and my blow-ups and my issues with anger, mm -hmm. but then I'd immediately go into my session with my analyst and try to figure out why. Yeah, exactly. And it took a long mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. to get to the bottom mm -hmm. of my stuff. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why people don't want to spend that time. Mm. Because sometimes I thought I'd never get there. Mm. And as if I'm there. I mean, mm. I don't know that any nobody gets, buddy yeah. ever gets there. Mm. But to have some insight and some awareness mm. around the complexes. Okay, I know what this is. Right. I don't have to go all the way down into it. Right. Well, and the thing is, is 
that as you do that, you know, as you, you start to look at it and you start to understand what the trigger is, mm -hmm. right? Because the trigger isn't about being in the moment, right? It's about something that happened in the past. Oh, yeah. As soon as you understand what the trigger is, then you get to a place where, where you have an opportunity to stop it in the moment. Yes. Right? And that, that's really, I mean, I think that's what ultimate empowerment is, so that you, you know what, what makes you mad, but you don't necessarily have to have um, a, a pretty violent response. You have an opportunity to say, okay, that makes me angry because of this and this and this. And then you can communicate that in a way that, that you get heard and you can negotiate with the person and, you know, those, you, don't, you, know, you don't need to, it doesn't mean you're not angry, but you have an opportunity to do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's ultimately about what the process is about so that we have more control over our reactions and they become reflective responses. Mm -hmm. So know thyself. Yeah, exactly. That's what that means to me. Well, exactly. And that, I think, is also where individuation kind of links into all of the great mystical traditions. You know, a number of the mystics say that that's, that's the goal. The goal is to know thyself and then have a connection to the divine, however you want to call that. You equate that to Jung's process of indivi that he mm -hmm. called individuation. Right. What does individuation mean? Well, uh, that's actually a really good, good question because now the way that Jung defined it was this process towards wholeness, but you never actually get there mm -hmm. because you can never actually be, you can never actually be whole. Right. Right. I always have this little funny joke where you kind of go. Um, Oh, yeah, I get it. And then you die. <laughs> um, but, you know, individuation, I think, is really is, is just about becoming oneself and one's authenticity and one gen one's genuineness. Our being in the world is less defined by our complexes and a false self and oh, a persona, right. but that we are in the world and being more about who we actually are and we are authentic and real you know people will say you know that person is the real deal mm -hmm. because actually what you get is a real sense of the person and i think ultimately that's what we're looking for we're looking uh, that's that's what individuation is is to become more of your your authentic self growing up or as teenagers mm -hmm. we want to fit in mm -hmm. we want to dress I, what i see is people dressing alike wearing their hair the same oh, way yeah, it's okay. you can't t i can't tell the difference between mm. the girls sometimes or the women mm. because they're all dressed alike they have the same accessories they put their makeup on the same way they right. style their hair the same way and for me i i didn't want to be like everybody else mm -hmm. i wanted to be who i was mm. But that's not always a safe thing to do. That's absolutely true. I mean, there is a lot of pressure to conform. Why is that, though? Well, I think there are a couple of things. You know, we are social animals. Mm -hmm. We need to belong. We want to be accepted. We want to be heard. We don't, you know, our whole right brain and all, all our relationship stuff is geared to attachment. So, and to be belonging and uh, to be connected. I mean, we are hardwired to be connected. And so um, we often will go to great lengths to make sure that we are connected to other people. And, you know, there are many stories where, you know, babies who, who are in orphanages, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't get physical care or right. if, they don't, if they don't actually have a connection to some kind of caregiver, whether it's a nurse or whatever, you know, they die because we, we actually need that to survive. So I think that's the biological aspect, the, the, the brain attachment. Mm -hmm. But I think also as we, and that's really how the shadow develops is as that as we grow up there are certain things in our families that are supported and accepted and encouraged 
And there are other things that are not encouraged and not accepted. And so the things that are not encouraged and not accepted go into the shadow. Mm -hmm. They are who we are, but they go into the shadow. And then we start to adapt to our social environment, whatever it happens to be, whether it's family or school or whatever, so that we are, that we're accepted. And then second half of life rolls around and all that stuff starts to, Mm -hmm. you know, come up and, you know, we need to accept that and we need to work that out. So then why did Jung develop his theory or his concept of individuation? With all of that being said about the necessity of why we want to conform Mm. so that we fit in and we're Mm. accepted, what's the deal with individuating? Right, right. Well, it's actually very interesting because I think the seeds of that come from the Red Book and and the history related to Jung and Freud, which is, for me, it's a really interesting... It, for me, that, that whole relationship is actually really, really interesting because Freud demanded... He demanded a, allegiance and obedience of everybody in that, that Vienna circle yeah right and there is this report that's in memories dreams and reflections where freud says you know we have to make a dogma out Mm -hmm. of the libido theory right Mm -hmm. and you know and jung's aghast at at that and because jung jung always had this kind of dual interest and i think that's where where his I think that's where his major contribution is, is trying to connect science and religion, Yeah. right? So he writes uh, The Symbols of Transformation, um, which starts to explore mythology and mm-hmm. um, imagery and symbolism. And he's already interested in astrology. He's already interested in parapsychology. His grandmother was apparently a clairvoyant. Yeah. His his mother was said to have second sight. There are all sorts of these kind of interesting experiences that he has. And he's starting to find himself very much um, confined, I guess, by Freud's need for this kind of strict yeah. allegiance. Mm-hmm. And so their personal friendship ends. Um, and he starts a kind of an active imagination process, which is now the Red Book. Mm-hmm. And, and what's really interesting about that is the connection between the spirit of the depths and the spirit of the times. Yes. And the spirit of the times is really about conformity. I mean, until when he got married in 1902, you know, he... He, uh, he stopped writing in his journal. He, he started to be a husband. They lived in the Bricolzi. Mm-hmm. He started to have children. He became a very collective man. Um, he was a teacher at the university. You know, he, he, he did all of that. And then he talks about the spirit of the depths, which is really the call to individuate. Mm-hmm. And you can see in those first, those first pages how in such turmoil he was. Of the Red Book. Of the Red Book, because he's really feeling that, you know, he, he was really holding the tension of the opposites, yeah. right? And um, and so he goes through this incredible process, but yet he's, he, he's still trying to understand what's going on, and so, you know, he worked on the images for a very long time. So... You know, there that spirit of the times versus the spirit of the depths is really, you know, that is his whole, his whole notion of individuation, right? Where you've got to disconnect yourself from the collective in some way to find out the truth of yourself, and then you come back, and come back, and then you figure out, you know, what it is that you need to be doing or what you need to be contributing to society mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to that. Um, so that really is, I think, the essence. Um, so the Red Book, I think, is really, you know, to see his individual process, and that is um, pretty cool. So in the preface to your book, you mentioned that um, you had a second edition published, mm. and... That was because of 
your experience of reading the Red Book and also Deidre Baer's biography mm -hmm. of Jung. Mm -hmm. Both of those books prompted you to revise your book yeah. and have it republished. Mm -hmm. Was it in 2014 it yep. was republished? Yep. So, yeah, because um, the whole idea about individuation as an ethical process, mm -hmm. I started to think about um, the ethical, Jung's ethical confrontation with the unconscious. Yes. And the only material I had was Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Right. So when I originally wrote it, that's all I had. That was all the information I had. Mm -hmm. And so when the Red Book came out, I realized that the first edition of of the book was was way out of date because now there's all this material mm -hmm. we actually got it right from from Jung himself what his own experience was not you know 1958 or 1959 when he wrote it much later and also because he was still quite protective of some of that material in the red book he didn't show it to very many people and the red book in its you know was was in a vault in a bank in Zurich right. for 50 years before um, before it was published mm -hmm. you mentioned that he was reluctant to publish the red red book and a few months after it came out i attended a presentation at the jung center in evanston by a couple of analysts that were there at the rubin museum mm -hmm. when it was presented and um, one of the analysts was adamant that Jung did want it published, but I've also heard that, that he didn't. And sometimes when I go to pick it up, I, I always hesitate because I wonder if, you know, is this, was this okay with him? Well, he was quite conflicted about it. Um, some of the stuff is, has been present. He presented a number of the pieces in that um, in, in, from what I understand in some of the lectures, uh, some of the images did get published yes. in word and image, right? right? Um, from what I understand, he had a manuscript uh, of just the text and then the commentary um, towards the end of the, night, the teens and early 20s mm -hmm that he uh, sent out to various people, including um, Mrs. Baines, what's her name? Oh, Carl, yes, yes. Right? Which is where uh, Sonu Shamdasani actually found excerpts of this. So there were bits and pieces that had gone out uh, to, uh, for people to review. But I think he was also very protective of it because sure. um, because he felt that you know he might get labeled crazy, and in fact you know one of the editors of the Princeton, uh, the Bollingen series actually you know said you know mentioned that he was psychotic or something like that, that right? right? There is this whole, until we had, wow. the, until the Red Book was actually published, there, yeah. was all, there was this mythology that he had a psychotic break. But in fact, he didn't. I mean, he still saw patients. Um, he still had, did his military service. He still was doing a number of things um, in his daily life that would suggest that he was not, you know, he wasn't mentally ill. I'm smiling because I, I'm thinking, well, he didn't have, Jung didn't have Jung to tell him no. it wasn't psychotic. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so I feel like I know better now, but he didn't. He no. Was, he, he was winging it. He was. Yeah, exactly. So now we've got the material, so, you know, it's, it really does change a huge amount. Um, what, what does it change? I mean, what did you go back into your original book and change based on it? Well, I what I did was I changed about four or five pages. I added a whole bunch of information around the ethical confrontation with the unconscious mm -hmm. and took uh, not, a, not a lot uh, of new information, but I did add uh, some more facts and more document, like more documentation um, based on the Deidre Bear book and based on the Red book um, to, to fill out that section, to keep the thesis of the, you know, the main premise of my book, I needed to really add that material other than that because it was just not going to be um, 
it was just going to be way out of date. So would you tell us a bit about what you mean about the ethical process? Like I said before, you know, the unconscious is much bigger than our little egos. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, and it has a tendency, as you, as you know, as you talked about, to uh, pull us into its sphere. And so, you know, the ego has all of these intentions and then, you know, we were going to, we're going to get, we're going to get pulled into the unconscious and we're going to stick our foot in it. We're going to say the wrong thing or, you know, whatever it happens to be. So, um, that's inevitable. If you have any encounter with the unconscious, if you have any encounter in any therapeutic kind of situation, you're going to have to deal with stuff that you don't know about yourself. And that may hurt other people, right. may hurt you, yeah. uh, it may get you into a lot of trouble. Um, in its worst case, you can go to jail, you can lose your license, you can, you know, you can get yourself in situations totally unconsciously. And I think, you know, if you, if you kind of think about, um, actually, I'm quite interested in this, in situations where there is something that happens in a flash of a moment and somebody's life changes. Uh, that's where the unconscious really, and I can give you an example, that's where the unconscious really kind of erupts um, and takes a person or takes a group of people into something that was not intended, and lives change. Um, and so the question is, what happens as a result of that? Right. Sometimes it can be quite tragic. Hopefully not. But it, but it can be. And this, I'll give you an example that's mm -hmm. really that I think is really, really interesting. Uh, about three or four years ago in, in Toronto, uh, one of our politicians uh, was coming home from uh, an anniversary dinner. And uh, a bicycle courier who had been uh, known to be angry and very confrontational and so uh, an experience happened at a, a, an intersection mm -hmm. where the bicycle courier had come up. Um, the politician and his wife had not been dr drinking. It was in the middle of summer. Their top was the top of their convertible was down and the bicycle courier got it in his head that he had been slighted. And so there's a confrontation that happened at a stoplight downtown Toronto where the bicycle courier actually came in to the car, grabbed the wheel, and all of a sudden something changed. And uh, the driver, uh, the politician, mm -hmm. drove trying to get this guy off of him. Right. And in the process, uh, the bicycle courier dies. And the politician was charged with manslaughter mm. and you know in that moment there is no opportunity for a, a special act of reflection I mean their survival mechanism kicks in and they're having a, a, a literally a confrontation with a car mm -hmm. and the driver is trying to extricate himself is trying to save his wife who's in the passenger side um, the bicycle courier is is in a rage mm -hmm. and is clearly not thinking and they're going back and forth and the bicycle courier gets hit via posts and a fire right. hydrant and stuff like that um, and the driver stays and but he is charged and he's a it's a public profile mm -hmm. But I think what's interesting is that kind of confluence of events that in which there is no, you know, there's there's no, um, it just happens mm -hmm. and lives change and people die. And I think that those are kinds of situations where the unconscious erupts. Now he... There was a trial, I think he was acquitted, but he wrote a book about it, mm -hmm. about how his life changed as a result of that. And I think that the those are the kinds of things that happen, where that is how powerful the unconscious can be. Uh, so, you know, we have you have to be really mindful of, of that, and sometimes it will take you 
hopefully one has some level of consciousness, but it can happen to anybody, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how powerful. And, you know, things happen that we actually don't have. If we had a chance to do them over again, oh my gosh, wouldn't we do that? Right. So unfortunately, we need to accept the consequences of where we are unconscious. And hopefully, we are, if it's within two people, we're able to, to you're able to work it out and there's some f forgiveness and compassion and you can apologize and work it out between the two people mm -hmm. if it's a little bit larger thing then you may have to go to jail but you know it's that's the kind of thing that um, interests me a great deal what would you say to someone that says well I'm never unconscious <laughs> I know <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, some people I think would would say that they would, and they're unconscious in saying that they're <laughs> unconscious. Right, <laughs> right. I wouldn't even argue with so much. Okay, fine. If that's what you believe, it, there's no there's no point in actually having an argument. Is that one of the benefits of being in analysis? Is developing a relationship with the unconscious, mm -hmm. and going back to that, what we were talking about before, about know thyself. Yep, absolutely. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the unconscious won't erupt. Oh, absolutely not. Right. And in fact, Jung did say the, the more conscious you get, the deeper the shadow gets. So in fact, as you become more conscious, you have to deal with the darker aspects of yourself. That's fascinating. Would you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, because that that's one of the pithy little Jung quotes right. that I see. Right. The brighter the light, the, the darker, darker the, the shadow. shadow. Right. What does that really mean? Well, it means that you need to deal with the, the can be the very dark aspects of yourself. That doesn't necessarily uh, look very pretty. Right. You need to get in touch with the instinctual level of the of the unconscious which could involve um, and I'll just get like really direct about this yeah. um, desire for revenge vindictiveness uh, desire to kill um, jealousy um, you know that those kind of really depression uh, dark, dark emotions that can overcome you. I think that that really is, uh, the, at, the, at the worst, That I think okay. that's really w what it's about. Like for me, actually, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Usually what happens for me is that I experience it physically, which is kind of interesting. The story would be that I was in an encounter, I was in a meeting where something happened that really irritated me and mm -hmm. also kind of came out of the blue. And, um, and I couldn't deal with it at the moment, so I had to park it. And as I was leaving the meeting and walking to the streetcar uh, to go home, I was I'm thinking about this and I'm really, um, and I'm ruminating about it and I'm not really paying attention. Mm -hmm. And there was that moment where I was not conscious basically of what was going on for me and I twisted my ankle. Oh. And it was so interesting to have that experience because there was about two seconds where I was hovering on whether I was going to fall mm -hmm. or whether I was going to right myself, mm -hmm. and I fell. Mm -hmm. And so this whole situation literally tripped me up. And I was fine. I mean, it didn't hurt myself. I was a little embarrassed because all these people are coming and saying, you okay, you okay, and I, you know, lift me up and stuff like that. But but what's really interesting is that that often is how the shadow manifests for me. I lit I fall, I trip. So I always know when I when I trip or or you know I forget something or whatever. You know I know that that's that's the unconscious that's trying to to get in touch with me. But it's also about uh, as I said containing those. Dark emotions, negativity, um, anger, rage—you know, all all of those, uh, the all of those emotions that fuel our growth and our maturation. 
But when they come, that, that's the prima materia when the alchemists talk about that. But, mm -hmm. you know, being able to hold that and contain that um, so that it doesn't totally leak out. Sometimes you can't do that, but then you have to accept the, the consequences of that. Uh, I guess I'm wondering what you meant by the brighter the light. How is it that one's light is brighter than someone else's? Level of consciousness? Yeah, level of consciousness, um, level of integration, which is really, um, you know, as you do the work, as you become aware of material, then then your experience of yourself becomes more comprehensive. So mm -hmm. you you're you feel more solid, you feel more yourself, you know, you're kind of really present, you're here. You know, people get attracted to that, but then the other the con the other side of that is like a power complex. So you get like gurus or spiritual teachers or things like that who or what Jung would call the man of personality, right? That that have a certain kind of spiritual um, awareness or have achieved a certain kind of spiritual maturation, but then get sucked into the adoration, um, the 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 projection of the self by the people who follow them. And there are a number of people, analysts, who've, you know, suffered, who have succumbed to that as well. And you can get quite sucked into that. Then you get inflated and you think, rather than actually acknowledging that you're playing a role, you get seduced by the power of your own, your own consciousness. And we're all susceptible to that. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer to that? Being in integrity and, and, you know, and being mindful. And not, you know, it's a dangerous topic for me to be because um, I start to write about something and then I get really tested in terms of, like, having to walk the talk. Um, so it's really about walking the talk. And if you fall off the wagon in terms of that, you just have to, you have to make amends. You have to figure out how to remedy the situation. In your book, you talk about what Jung called the voice of God. Mm. What is that? Mm -hmm. Well, his, his idea was that the voice of God was our kind of in, in our internal conscience. And he, he talked about conscience as a psychological function. And in a way, it's also our call of individuation. Mm -hmm. So... But it's tricky because you're never quite sure where the what the qual. If you say it's the voice of God, you're not quite sure where that voice comes from. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really the a pro needing to be very um, needing to do the work to see whether that's the truth, like mm -hmm. that's the authentic. So as as a um, a psychological process. Conscience is that uh, that call to really follow the inner voice, no matter where that takes you. But that could put you in opposition to society, right. to people you care about. And I think that he's talking about his, in a way, his break with Freud, because that he really needed to to follow his own path. Uh, he, I mean, he really needed to follow his own path. So it's in a way, it's also the voice of the divine in in us. It's that it's that um, you know that drive towards. I don't like using the word wholeness because I don't think that really captures the whole thing. It's the drive to become who we are supposed to become. I see. Right. And you, you mentioned that Jung's major contribution to our understanding of the psyche is the principle of opposition. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I mean, it, hap it can happen in a very specific kind of situation where you're trying to decide whether you're going to respond to somebody or you're trying to decide um, what you're going to do in a particular situation, you're really torn, you know, really, really psychologically torn, and you don't quite know what to do. You've got two alternatives, mm -hmm. do, do I or don't I, right? right? So at, at that level, 
you may need to wrestle with both of those to find out basically what your heart tells you you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are the big questions like, do you leave your job? Do you leave your marriage? Do you stay with your marriage? You know, those big, big kind of life questions. Do you move to another place? Those are much larger, larger questions. How do you relate to the collective or how do you relate to your family? You know, those, those are really, really big questions. And so that, that can take a long time. And it's not, and then he talks about the transcendent function. Yes. Right? But often it's more like um, you could side on one, you could, on one moment you're siding on, on one side, but mm -hmm. on the other moment you're siding on the other side. And so there's my experience working with people and myself is you kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth right. until you're you're able to hold both things. It's not so much of a back and forth thing. And, and then something arises in which it becomes clear what your next step is going to be. Whether you, you make a move, whether you change jobs, whether you change careers, you know, there are a lot, whatever the question happens to be. So this conflict within the psyche is what Jung said was the cause of neurosis. That's correct. So if we're trying to choose between one side or the other, mm and we're vacillating, or the pendulum is swinging mm. from one side to the other. And is it the case that we need to hold both sides closer and closer and closer together, like you were just describing, yeah. until that transcendent function, that third option arises that contains something of both? That is correct. Right. Your book, actually, you explain the transcendent function better than I've ever seen anywhere else. And I hadn't gotten to tweet it yet. But when I was uh, reviewing the book for this interview and I tweeted your definition, I just, I wanted to mention this before, your definition of individuation, somebody tweeted me right back. I, I don't know if that. you saw I that. Saw he that. said that is the best definition, you put it so succinctly, mm. that is the best definition of individuation that I've ever heard. And Everybody, I'm going to include that on mm. Christina's page on the website oh, thank you. for this podcast. Well, you'll notice that I'm, I, it's for me, it has to be really practical. Yeah. Like people need to understand yes. how to live it. And thank you for saying that because that's the direction that I want this mm. podcast to go mm. in. I want to focus on more on how can people apply this in their everyday life? Mm. How can this help them? And also, why Jung, mm. why his psychology, why Jungian analysis? Mm. I'd like to get more into that. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to become an, a Jungian analyst as opposed to, say, a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist? Well, it, it's a second career for me. What what was interesting is my then mother in law uh, gave me my first book in 1980. So I was uh, about 25 or something like that. I can't remember how old I was. Uh, I was fascinated by Jung. I mean, there was that time in Toronto when the Lay Foundation was really active. They had lots of speakers all over the place. Married women talked a lot. Yeah. And um, my mother-in-law, my then mother-in-law, was really, really active. And um, she would always talk about um, Jung and Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of my introduction into the family. And uh, I was just absolutely fascinated mm -hmm. because of the idea of religion and, and ethnology and uh, you know it, it wasn't just about psychology for me it was about this entire right. breadth of human condition of the human condition and so I just started to read voraciously mm -hmm. and I went to lectures and I started to read and uh, I went into um, uh, and then I went into a Freudian analysis, and I was in a Freudian analysis for a long, mm. long time. Yeah, 
uh, he's 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 passed on now, but I would call him my Frungian because he was kind of half Freudian and half Jungian. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the couch. But we talked about Jungian ideas, and he was on the board of the, the society. So I'm I'm quite grateful. But he was my Frungian analyst, <laughs> um, and so I uh, was doing consulting work in arts and culture. I have an MBA, mm-hmm. business background, and I was happily doing that and reading and doing my own process and all of that. And um, and when I was in about 35. You know, I had that. I had a little bit of a midlife thing, and mm-hmm. I kind of said, "Well, I'm not sure I want to do this for the rest of my life." Right. There's, there's some, there's something of the creativity that I'm missing, and so at that point, I decide I'm going to do a Jungian analysis and decide and thought to myself, "Well, you know, I actually uh, would like to, with the idea of maybe going into training." Mm-hmm. And um, but that took four or five years to um, for me to actually be really clear that that's actually what I wanted to do is actually to go into training. Mm-hmm. So I did a number of different things. I um, I was working for a consulting company. I started my own consulting company. I you know I picked up jobs here and there. All all at, in, as I was in this kind of very much of a transition period between between my old profession and and what I what I wanted to do. I basically wanted to reconnect with some life energy, some kind of creative life energy. So I went to India for a month as a as a trip and um, uh, and I remember quite distinctly that I walked, uh, we were in a bus going <laughs> going up a very tiny, very narrow road in southern India. Mm. And, I, um, and I thought to myself, well, what do I really want to do next? And what came up just from the depth of myself is I want to go into, I want to become a young analyst. Wow. And it took then another couple of years to get that process going. But I went to Zurich really also uh, to, to see what, what that was like for me and, you know, if this was really going to be my path. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I just I'm, I feel very fortunate to be able to do what I do. And I still do consulting work for nonprofits. And so I still do both things. It's a, and I'm, it's a little odd, but it makes sense for me. <laughs> I'm involved in a family business. And we do lots of consulting for nonprofits and stuff. So, so Christina, we're coming to the end of our time together today, and I'm wondering um, what you have in store next. Well, um, there are a couple of things I've been working on for the last three or four years or so. I, I want to take the image of the heart into um, a link between mysticism and psychology and psychoanalysis. So I've been doing a um, I've been doing lots of research on that. I feel like I'm just about ready to write. But I've been doing it uh, with uh, conducting with a number of colleagues um, various spiritual retreats. Uh, one is uh, we're doing, we do in Nova Scotia with my good friend B.D. Popescu, which is coming up at the beginning of December oh. in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Um, it's our third retreat called Gateways of the Divine, and uh, the title for this retreat is going to be The Soul of Nature, The Nature of Soul, oh, wow. which is all about the research that I'm doing. Um, we did the heart last last time, and I do with Julie Simmons, uh, who's an astrologer in Toronto, we just did a retreat on the moon, the symbol of the soul, the astrological moon, the symbol of the soul, which was really great. And we're doing that again next uh, May in Ottawa, Ontario. And uh, I will be in Montreal next week uh, to talk about, uh, give a lecture on Jung and individuation and mysticism based on the Red Book. Oh, wow. So um, all of that work, I've, I've been doing that for about two or three years, which mm-hmm. is all um, linking, which is all preparation for starting to write. And part of the book, I'm hoping, is going to be part memoir for myself. 
um, to talk about my own spiritual journey and my own um, my own experience, but oh, nice. also to use um, the experiences of people that I know. And what the idea is 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 to have modern people writing about their mystical experiences of the divine. You know, oh, wow. so that's so that's what I'm working on. And it's been a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank I, you for your time, Christina. I We didn't even mention that you're also an astrologer oh, yeah. and that you studied with Liz Green, yeah. who is a famous astrologer, and she's also a Jungian analyst. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you'll consider coming back on for another interview. Yeah, that would be great. And we can talk about Jung and his um, association to astrology. Mm, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you. That's yeah, good. Thanks, Laura. I hope Laura. to talk to you again soon. Okay, great. I really appreciated Christina taking time out of her schedule to speak with me. You can visit her website, cjbecker.com, for more information about her practice, workshops, and retreats. And please visit the website, speakingofjung.com, where you'll find links to all the books and presentations that were mentioned today. There you'll also find a link to where you can watch Christina's segment in the new documentary movie, What is Synchronicity?, on our website, you'll also find all of the previous episodes of the podcast, which are available to download for free. You can also find this podcast on iTunes and on Stitcher. So with eternal gratitude to Hilton Hotels, Sean Lau, John Amenta, Kevin Panthera, Charlie Arthur, Diane Braden, and Carl Gustav Jung, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. Speaking of Jung